Frederick Stanley McGriff, Fred, Crime Dog, Toronto, AL, 1986 to 1990, San Diego, NL, 1991 to 1993, Atlanta, NL, 1993 to 1997, Tampa Bay, AL, 1998 through 2001 and 2004, Chicago, NL, 2001-2002, Los Angeles, NL, 2003. Crushed the ball with consistency for 19 seasons, using smooth left-handed swing to amass 493 home runs and 1,550 RBI. Hit 30 or more homers 10 times, the first to do so for five different teams. Finished among his league's top five in long balls and OPS in seven straight seasons, 1988 to 1994, topping the AL in homers in 1989 and the NL in 1992. Delivered heroics as cleanup hitter for the 1995 World Series champion Braves and hit 303 in 50 career postseason games. Three time Silver Slugger at first base and five time All Star earned 1994 All Star Game MVP honors. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh, hello. Hey. What a beautiful day. You know what I'm just saying? But I want to say hello to everyone here from Atlanta to San Diego, Toronto, to my hometown of Tampa Bay. Hey. And everywhere in between. Thank you for showing up. It is awesome to be here accepting this honor. What a blessing from the man upstairs. Beautiful weather. You can't beat it. And I'm so grateful to be going into the Baseball Hall of Fame alongside a guy like Scott Rowland, who played the game the right way, a true professional. I want to thank the many living legends sitting behind me. I'm humbled and honored to be standing in front of you and now to be part of, of this fraternity alongside you. I mean, just some great individuals behind me. I want to thank Jane Forbes Clark and her staff, Josh, John, and Whitney for all their work to get me ready for this special day and the entire staff that works behind the scenes at the museum make this place so special. i also like to thank the members of the Contemporary Baseball Era Players Committee who elected me. When your career is validated by former players and executives that saw you play, that's as good as it gets. I will never forget getting that call from Jane last December. About a month earlier, I talked to the Hall of Fame folks about how this voting works. They told me if elected, I would receive a call before it was announced on MLB Network, and please don't put it out there to go on social media. I'm like, cool, it's all good. So when my phone rang and my caller ID showed us from the Hall of Fame, with my wife and daughter at home, I slipped into my office and closed the door. I answered the phone and heard Jane say, congratulations, you've been unanimously elected to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. It was the best phone call of my life. But now remember, they told me to be careful about getting it on social media. 
So I'm whispering to Jane, okay, thank you. you know? I went back into the living room where my wife and daughter were. I didn't tell them about the news. I played calm, like I knew nothing. I just told them, hey, they're going to announce who got into the Baseball Hall of Fame at 8 o'clock on MLB Network, so let's turn it on. <laughs> hey, believe me, it was pure joy and happiness on my wife and daughter's face when it was announced that I was the next electee to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Then they both looked at me and said, you knew. You know, but it was, it was great. It's hard to put today's induction into perspective. This is baseball's biggest honor. This is like icing on a cake. You see, my goal was simply to make it to the big leagues. And I exceeded every expectation I could ever imagine, and then some. It is a great feeling getting recognized for your hard work. And now to have a plaque forever, forever hanging in the National Baseball Hall of Fame, it's unbelievable. What is your dream? Since elementary school, mine had been to play in the major leagues. It's been a long journey with a lot of hard work put in, thousands of hours trying to get better. But like I tell everyone, a computer can't measure what's in someone's heart. And I always had heart. Growing up in Tampa, Florida, my Lincoln Gardens neighborhood, I couldn't help but love baseball. I was always around it. I live less than a mile from the Cincinnati Reds complex in Al Lopez Field, where the Reds played spring training games and their minor league team, the Tampa Tarpons, played. The Reds were great back then, the big red machine. Bench, Perez, Morgan, just awesome people, awesome team. It was wonderful, great time. And from time to time, me and my friends got, got tickets to the game. The best part about those games was if you returned a foul ball to the team, you got a Coke and a hot dog. <laughs> hey, we couldn't wait for a ball to go foul, and then the mad scramble began. You know? And because I lived about a mile from my little league park, me and my buddies spent a lot of time playing ball there or at the Boys and Girls Club. We just picked teams and played. We all got along. It didn't matter where you're from. It was great just to get out and play. When the lights come on, you knew it was time to go home. Then I entered Tampa Jefferson High School my sophomore year, and I tried out for the varsity baseball team. As my school didn't have a JV team, I'd always been either a pitcher or first baseman in the league, but they had a senior first baseman. I knew him, he was a good man, so I figured to make that team, I would have to try out for the outfield. Other than one ball, ground ball getting past me, I thought I did okay. After the last day of tryouts, the coach popped quest and said, I'll post who made the team outside the locker room later tonight. With the flashlight, I looked for my name. Well, I didn't see my name on that list. It was disappointing. But that's how I found out I got cut. You know? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> when I saw Pop back in school, he was my driver's ed teacher. He told me to keep working hard and get stronger. I could have quit playing baseball, but I didn't. Instead, it motivated me. I started riding my bike about three miles each way to the gym. I got stronger, and I continued to play ball. The next year, I tried out again, and I made the team. But to this day, I know they still tease Pops about cutting me in the 10th grade. <laughs> Two years later, in 1981, I was selected in the ninth round of the baseball draft by the New York Yankees. I will always be thankful for the Yankees for giving me a chance to, to continue to pursue my dream. Once I signed, I bought my first car, a maroon white Cutlass Supreme. Hey, 
And I left home at 17 years old, driving down to the Yankee Rick League team in Bradenton, Florida. I went out and got off to a little bit of a slow start to my career and hit a buck 48 with zero home runs and 81 at bats. It was quite the learning experience, but I realized you have to treat baseball like it's a job, so I doubled my effort. I was on a mission to improve as a hitter. It was time to work. That meant becoming a student of the game, reading books, watching videos about hitting. Charlie Lyle's The Art of Hitting 300 became my go-to book. It was like my Bible. I read that book so many times during my career, from cover to cover, many days and nights, especially when I was struggling in the slump, trying to figure it out. George Brett was on the cover, and I had a lot of pics of George Brett, and he was the man, so I tried to pattern myself after George, because George was an unbelievable hitter. I repeated rookie ball the next year, and I hit much better, especially against the Blue Jays farmhands. That got me traded to Toronto in the offseason. Jays general manager, Pat Gillick, who's sitting up here, he saw the potential. I was happy because usually if a team trades for you, you know you got a chance. And four years later, after riding those buses through the Carolinas and Smoky Mountains, and then playing up here in Syracuse, my AAA manager, Doug Ott, gave me the news, you're going to the big leagues. I couldn't believe it. I was about to reach my ultimate goal, and my first phone calls went to my mom and dad. Then on May 18, 1986, at Exhibition Stadium up in Toronto, Canada, I had my first at bat against Don Schultz, right-handed pitcher with the Cleveland Indians. I'll never forget it. I singled up the middle, and that was the moment I started living my dream. And yes, I still have the ball. When I got traded to San Diego, Pat Gillick told me his wife Doris was very mad at him. But I knew baseball was a big business and trades are part of the game. While in San Diego, I played on some good teams with a bunch of great players like Hall of Famer Tony Gwynn, who I wish was sitting here behind me. What a true professional, a magician with the bat. He could hit the ball wherever he wanted. It was pretty impressive. I enjoyed my time as a Padre. Then General Manager Joe McElvain got orders to, in the middle of the season from his bosses to trade a few players to lower payroll. That's when another guy on this stage, John Sherholtz, traded for me, bringing me to the Braves. Joe McElvain was doing me a favor by trading me closer to as Tampa as possible. I was very excited to be joining a team that had been a couple of plays away from winning back-to-back -back championships in 1991, 1992. But I was nursing an injury when the trade happened. I drove, the day I drove to Atlanta, I left Tampa at noon. I didn't expect to play. But when I got to the ballpark, there was my name in the lineup. I was sweating. But I believe a man upstairs bought me some time when a food heat lamp caught on fire. <laughs> and the start of the game was delayed two hours, long enough for me to get some more treatment, and I felt a little bit better. I started the game, and I tied it up in the sixth inning with the home run. Then the next day, I hit two home runs, and the Braves team caught on fire. We ended up catching the Giants after being 10 games out of first place at the time of the trade, and we won the division. That 93 team was the best team I believe I ever played on, with Glavin, Maddox, and Smoltz pitching, plus, plus Bobby Cox leading the way. But two years later, in 1995, with the healthy Chipper Jones, it all came together. We finally pulled it off and won the first championship for the city of Atlanta, the proudest team moment of my career.
Then I got an opportunity to go home and play in front of family and friends when I joined the Tampa Bay Devil Rays to be part of the first season of Big League Baseball in the Tampa area. That's where I got to play alongside Wade Boggs, who's also from Tampa. When I first met Wade about 20 years earlier, he helped me out tremendously. We had a nice little two-hour conversation, and we talked hitting. And when I was in the minors, I looked for a lot of breaking balls, and I guessed and so forth. And Wade told me, Fred, look for that fastball on every pitch. And I did. And it worked. So to Wade, thank you. I was traded to Chicago and took a spin through Los Angeles before coming back home again to Tampa. I was blessed to play Major League Baseball for 19 seasons. What a journey, what a dream, playing in front of some great fans. I can't name everyone who's helped me, but I want to tell you about a few individuals that helped shape my journey along the way. During my time in the Yankees rookie ball, one person that kept me working was Ed Napoleon. He was a baseball lifer with over 40 years in the game as a manager, player, and coach. He says, son, I want you out here early at 8 a.m. every morning, and we're going to work. And he hit me ground ball after ground ball. We worked on all the plays the first baseman has evolved in, and it became a part of my daily routine for the rest of my career. And I didn't realize at the time, but later in life, I came to understand that this man went above and beyond to help me become a better ball player. Now to my good friend and workout partner, former Mets great Dave Magnin. Me and Dave would throw batting practice to each other, then hit ground balls to one another to try to get us ready for spring training, most of the time at Dave's old high school, Tampa Jesuit, where the students would come out and shag for us while me and Dave was hitting. It was awesome. We didn't have to pick up the balls or nothing. The kids just, it was outstanding. It was hilarious because Dave threw me nothing but strikes. It was great. He got me ready. And then when I threw to Dave, I was all over the place. <laughs> I hit him a few times, you know, I, oh, sorry, Dave, you know, but it was, it was great. And we worked out from once he graduated, graduated from college to the end of our careers, every off season, me and Dave. Cito Gaston was my hitting coach in Toronto, and we hit, hit, and hit. And we spent a lot of time working on hitting mechanics. We would hit before spring training games, after spring training games, and during the season, we would even take batting practice on the road five hours before the start of a game. Cito would get the young players, like me and Cecil Fielder. It wasn't an option. You had to be there. We hit all the time. We couldn't help but get, get better. We worked. To all my teammates, coaches, and trainers, in Toronto, San Diego, Atlanta, Tampa Bay, Chicago, and Los Angeles. You all part of this recognition. You helped me live out my dream. Thank you so much. No two people have bigger impacts on my life than my mom and dad. They both have passed away, but my mom and dad they were my number one fans. And all the ushers and concession stand workers, they all knew Mrs. McGriff. She let everyone know who her son was. <laughs> I'll walk around the park. Oh, yeah, Fred, I saw your mom. Oh, she was nice. I'll talk to your mom. <laughs> and this, this is constant. My mom was a school teacher. My dad owned a TV repair shop. They never pushed me to play baseball but they always supported me. They both drove me to my games and practices, and I know they're both looking down, smiling today, so proud of their youngest son. <laughs> to my big brother and my sisters, 
Tara and Sandra, thanks for being great role models and showing me the way and always being there for me growing up. I was a little, bro little brother. Surprise package. <laughs> Thank you. To my son and daughter, Eric and Erica, remember when you used to join me on the road trips? You tossed me rolled up socks for me to hit in the hotel rooms. Those are the moments I, never, I always remember. When you're struggling and you got to do something, I would take a, just roll, roll up a newspaper. Hey, Eric, Erica, just, just throw it like this. We'll be all right, you know. I got to be ready for tomorrow. You know, you always be my kids. You've turned into such impressive people. I'm so proud of you both. To my wife, Veronica, who has been with me since we worked together at Burger King, yeah. and who has prayed for me every step of the way. You're a great mom to our kids. The way you raised them and traveled all over with them that allowed me to pursue my dream and focus on my game. More than anyone, this honor is yours too. I love you. I'm humbled to be standing on the stage with some of the greatest players to ever play this game. Honestly, would have been happy just playing one day in the big leagues. This means a lot to me, so I encourage you, whatever your dream is, to never give up. And always remember to stay true to who you are. There will be fires along the way, but those fires can ignite the spark to the next season of your life. Thank you all again for being here today. God bless you all.